Hey everybody, thank you so much for tuning in this week to The Remnant Radio. We've got a very exciting episode for you today. We're going to be talking about sin, the sin nature, and why we were born this way. It's going to be a great episode. You guys stay tuned. Uh, we, we started with the center of our system, which is God. Um, who, who is God? Of what sort is he? What is his nature? Uh, who does he claim to be? There Can, is there a God? I mean, we, we began with that because that's the beginning and that's the center. And God, of course, is triune. He, he is one God, eternally coexistent in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And so we covered all of those as well. And that being the center of our system, all other doctrines are then derivative from that one. And so the way that we began is by locating the center in God. And now we're going to begin speaking about the uh, other doctrines that we derive from that center. Today is the first one. Uh, it's actually going to be three. We're going to cover three of these today. Angelology, which is the study of angels, anthropology, which is the study of man, and hamartiology, which is the study of hamart. Oh, nope. I'm sorry, of sin. Yes, yes. There we go. I was catching you to see if you, if you also knew that. Yes. <laughs> Very good. It's like the study of hermeneutics, the study yeah. of Herman. Um, <laughs> Herman. So uh, when, when we're talking about sin today, uh, give us give us a, a brief definition of what sin is. Um, I think that defining, th there's a couple of people say, you know, sin is deliberately, intentionally missing the mark. Mm -hmm. Some would define sin as breaking God's law. Others would define sin in a, in a plurality of ways. But let's make sure that we're very clear. Some even say that we're born guilty of sin from birth. So mm -hmm. if we understand what sin is, I think it can kind of push us into. Yeah, I think before, I think before we, well, obviously the textbook definition of sin is of or having to do with the Philadelphia Eagles. That, there you go. that actually is I've the, heard that before. the biblical definition. But uh, before we really can understand a true definition of sin, we have to understand who man is first. Yeah. Uh, because that's going to be part of our definition of sin. It's going to be so synonymous with man <laughs> that you, you can't separate the two necessarily. And, and possibly before we do that, um, we, we could spend maybe 60 seconds talking about angels because uh, you and I both, we have a lot of uh, Christian friends on Facebook, right? And if there's one thing that we see a whole lot of, it's uh, people claiming that their loved one has is now an angel in yeah, heaven. Yeah, absolutely uh, true. On Facebook, it was really popular in the nineties. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, really? Well, then I have several people in my feed who Stuck are still in the living 90s. in the nineties. Yeah. <laughs> well, I just I remember touched by an angel propagating that. Oh yeah. Do you remember that? <laughs> oh my goodness, that's almost eighties. Wow, you're right. About, I forgot about that show. I'm yeah. pretty sure that show pushed that very heavily. It probably did. I never saw even a single episode. I so, definitely remember yeah. watching reruns as a child. Yeah. Yeah, the the we could we could spend a whole podcast on angelology, but really uh the most important thing to remember at this level uh, is angels are different beings entirely than humans. Mm -hmm. All right. Angels are created beings just like like humans are. They're celestial beings, but they're finite. All right, they're not they're not God, and they're not human, and humans are a separate creation of God. Therefore, angels never become human, and humans never become angels. Now, while the Bible is um, not particularly verbose on this topic, the Bible is clear about that fact: mm -hmm. the two never become one another. So there there it is. We've covered angelology uh, in that 60 quickly seconds or less. So um, w when we talk about angelology, is that important because of uh, the origination of sin, or is that too big of a tangent for this go around? Yeah, I, I don't I don't really see that necessarily as as um, uh, a big part of the concept of hamartiology necessarily. Uh, uh, it, I've just learned that it's important for us to have the, the conversation because there are so many people who are, 
just don't know. Yeah. You know, you're, you're not going to become an angel. And no, no, I hear your you. loved one, you know. And so um, if we can sort of get past some of those sort of elementary um, assumptions, then we can take the time and go through them. Hey, look at your knaves topical out and start studying the different kinds of right. angels. And what are they messengers? Are they task uh, doers? What You know, all of those things are very interesting. But when we talk about hermartiology, I'm going to locate that really in man. That's not to say that the angels didn't sin sure, when they fell. Sure. But um, the, the, the hermartiology as it pertains to our understanding of Christianity Boy, we want to really identify that with ourselves for sure. So. That's good. That's good. So um, uh, just a quick intro to the show, guys. I know audio is muted. I apologize for that. Uh, but if you're new to the Remnant Radio, here are the ways that you can follow us. You can follow us on Facebook, on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, and the Aramaic Broadcasting Network. So we reach uh, this month 27,000 people through live video, which was really, really cool. We hope it blesses you. Uh, Remnant Radio exists to challenge orthodoxy, embrace diversity, and empower you for practical ministry. So thank you so much for watching the program today. I'm here with Michael Mitchell. We are doing our systematic theology during lunchtime, the Lunchtime Theologian broadcast. And uh, we're specifically talking about hermosiology, sin, how it came into being, uh, uh, who done it, uh, uh, and then why we are the way we are. I think yeah. is going to give a, a pretty good, pretty good yeah. outline of what the show is going to yeah. be about today. So um, let's let's talk about the fall. Um, uh, Adam, Eve, partaking of the fruit, sin, they fall. Um, would we say they are the guilty party? That's mm-hmm. you said you want to frame it around that. Yeah, yeah. We'll <laughs> we'll start really by talking about man. Uh, look, look, who is man and what makes him so different from, from the rest of creation? Uh, there are, uh, what, what does it mean to be human, in other words? Um, there are a couple of different ways of viewing uh, the definition of a human being. Uh, there are people who are called trichotomists. Mm-hmm. Uh, they believe that the human is, you know, mind and, and heart and body, or they may substitute mind, spirit, soul, spirit for one of sure. those. Yeah. And then there are those who say you know, he's just body and soul. Those are called dichotomous. Mm-hmm. And there are those who would like to make a big stink about this and mm-hmm. uh, you know get all sort of dogmatic about you know well you have to be this and you have to be actually both of these positions are orthodox. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's there's nothing wrong with occupying either of these positions. Um, in my denomination, the book that's used to train our ministers by, by Horton and Menzies uh, doesn't really take a hard line approach between the two. It mentions both of them. Uh, from, from my standpoint, just my, my personal uh, standpoint contemplating this doctrine, um, it, it really all comes down to the fact that humankind is one entity separated into two spheres, the material and the immaterial. Mm-hmm. All right. We are body and soul. And the trichotomists want to say, well, now let's argue about what soul means. And, and they, so they split that up into two others. If you feel like doing that, that's fine. Uh, you're not getting a bad grade in my class over that. Sure. Uh, but I, I don't really consider it an important part of this discussion. Uh, yeah. Material and immaterial is the important thing here. Uh, we are both material and immaterial. And that's important. We're not a body who has a soul and we're not a soul who has a body we are body and soul Mm -hmm. and that that's how we're created and that's the eternal state for us the eternal state for for us is not floating around uh, as a disembodied spirit uh, it is physically resurrected, body yeah. and soul. And so. Most most of the the classes in education that I've had um, in the pretty informal Bible school that I had, trichotomist all the way. Mm-hmm. Um, and dichotomy was really brought up, I think, when I went to uh, m- my wife lived on campus at Christ for the Nations, so there was a couple dichotomists there, and we we, we hashed out some stuff. Um, so when when we talk about this issue, I think. Um, the reason it can be such a stumbling block for people is because they've been taught trichotomy their entire life. Oh, yeah. Um, so, so again, plenty of grace. Sure. Still part of the family. Um, but and I, I, can't, I can't even say I know where I land on the line quite yet. But I think the reason that this is such a difficult debate is because in Hebrew, the words are so interchangeable. And then we don't mm-hmm. even really see what would be considered a mind, will, emotion, uh, and then soul and spirit kind of delineation until mm-hmm. Paul shows up with Greek. The philosophy mm-hmm. and we kind of assume that Paul is just reaching his audience who already understands 
um, this context and, of and he uses spirit. the term so interchangeably that you, yeah. you really can't uh, develop a doctrine rooted on that yeah. so it's uh, really the idea of trichotom uh, the trichotomy uh, is is more philosophical than it is explicitly biblical mm -hmm. uh, again I don't have a problem with it it's it, it, it's just it it, it it still like dichotomy attempts to understand the definition of humanity as material and immaterial it just wants to have a longer conversation about what it means to be immaterial. And we only have an hour. So, yeah, so, so the, the assumed uh, train of thought that I'm coming to is, okay, if we are a dichotomy and not a trichotomy, how does that affect the initial death of sin? Like when sin comes into the world, the day that you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. Mm -hmm. um, would it hash that out for me? Is there a part of the dichotomy that died or is it all of, all of the it. third portion of the all, so of all of it yeah just exactly like all of creation is marred by that moment all of humanity is marred as well uh and and even the uh yeah it, we're all the, the body and the soul and if you think the spirit is something different than the soul that's marred too mm -hmm. uh where everything is marred and standing in need of redemption uh, because of that so no, n nothing is affected. Um, there's, there, there are no ramifications of believing trichotomy over dichotomy that, uh, that are eternal or, you know, sure. your names are still written. It's in not a five cardinal life. doctrine yeah. kind of thing. Uh, you're just going to, you know, you're going to have an asterisk by your name. That's, that's all. But uh, other than that, it's fine. Yeah. That's funny. Okay, so um, when we are talking about this uh, sin, I, I think of um, who, I think of three people, if you will. I think of Adam. I think of Jesus, and I think of us, and I think of good, what good. what is the because we have the first Adam, we have the second Adam, and then we have whatever the second Adam imputed to us. Mm -hmm. um, what, how, how would you how would you split them up? Would you split them up? You have Adam pre fall, you have Adam post fall. Uh, what happened in the life of Adam uh, that made yeah, him different? You're, you you you're doing it. You're doing it very well too. Uh, I I'm I'm not in quite as big a hurry to get there because sure. I I still want to. I still want to define humanity just a little bit before we move to sin, uh, but but you you've said it about as perfectly as as anybody could really a pre fall and post fall and and uh, what has been done on our behalf. One one thing that we have to keep in mind when we're talking about humanity is that we are all made in the image of God. Mankind bears the imago Dei or the image of God, mm -hmm. and there's been a, a good amount of discussion throughout the years uh, about what that means. You know, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? Does it mean that God has, you know, opposable thumbs? Does God have consciousness, and we have consciousness, and that's what you know. There's a variety of different ways of, of looking at this, and, and I look at it like this. <laughs> right, that was cheap. I was just focus grouping that one. For here. those of you uh, who are looking on the podcast, it. he um, made this face of yeah, seeming right, constipation, yeah. I think That's was it. That's the way it I would. It was constipatory yeah. in nature, yes. <laughs> that was very good, yeah. Now, there is a structural <laughs> concept of the Imago Dei. Uh, that, that, that there's something about the way that we are wired that is godlike. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, um, the, probably the most famous understanding of this is that we have a self-awareness and a self-consciousness, at least morally, mm -hmm. that no other animal, no creation uh, has whatsoever. Uh, for example, my, my dog Perseus has absolutely no shame. He has no moral consciousness of, of right or wrong. What he has is he's classically conditioned. He recognizes that if he pees on the carpet, he's going to give me this look. He doesn't really feel bad about it. He'll sure. do it again, you know? I if mean, you weren't there, absolutely. Right, man. There's, he doesn't have a, an inner morality that drives him. He doesn't have this conscience that drives him. He is a dumb beast. He's an animal uh, that is devoid of that sort of moral self-awareness. Humanity alone has that. Hmm. And so that, that has been one argument about what the Imago Dei means throughout history. And I, and I don't have much of an argument with that. I do, however, have what I think is a richer and fuller understanding of the Imago Dei that maybe we haven't thought about too much. I'm not the first to think of it. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of scholars throughout the centuries who've talked about it, but I think it bears thinking about here. And that is what I'll call the aesthetic concept of the Imago Dei. We know that God created the heavens and the earth. Why? Why did God create Why the heavens and the earth? Why did God create the heavens and the earth? According to Revelation 4, 
for pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> he felt like it. Yeah. He created for the heck of it. That was it. He didn't create in order to do something else. There was no utilitarian aspect to his creation. He didn't create because he needed an audience for his love. If God needed anything in you, he wouldn't be God. Sure. Right? And so there's no utility in his creation. It is creation without utility. And that's a real clumsy way of describing it. There is a much cleaner, neater, more beautiful way of describing the process of creation without utility. And that word is art. Yeah. That's, that's we, an artist creates for the sake of creating, for pleasure. Sure. That's it. Uh, there is no utility there. And you, some people will say, well, you know, a beaver, um, a beaver makes a dam. You know, that's an act of creation. Actually, not, not in the Hebrew sense. In Genesis 1, when, when God has spoken about it, he's spoken about using the term bara, which mm -hmm. is a, an artistic type of ex nihilo creation. Mm -hmm. In Genesis 2, the verb asa is used, which speaks about a craftsmanship, a type of making, like when I was a cabinet maker, the yep. attention to detail in making cabinets. So a beaver... Uh, makes a dam, but he does so for utilitarian purposes to survive. Right. It's part of his instinct, right? Only Michelangelo paints because he feels like it. You know, that's a, a human, the human uh, aspect of the Imago Dei is that God is the supreme artist and we alone are capable of doing that on a smaller scale, some type of creation artistically. So uh, I guess when I think of the 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 scope of um, anytime anyone's ever asked me the question why did god create the heavens and the earth why why is this cosmic uh, uh <laughs> chessboard have been set up what's what's the end game solution here my end game's always been in an explanation and correct me if i'm wrong or or leave it up in the air uh, is to prepare a bride for christ to present christ because that's the end of the book the end of the book is um and you could say that is his ultimate artist, and if that's the way that you present it. Um, but it makes sense to me that Adam is created in the garden uh, alone, um, has a job to do, and then creates Eve, someone he can commune mm -hmm. with. Like, I think that there is this this idea that there was no one like him, and then God created someone like him so that it community, would be good. Community, community, yeah. So, yeah, and then I think that kind of speaks to our relationship with God. It's because mm -hmm. we're created in his image. You know, he, that's a dog, that's a giraffe, that's a horse, mm -hmm. um, but I can't commune with them because they're not like me. I think that that's some very good thinking, but I, the, where I'm going to differ with you is that it necessarily describes utility. God didn't need to do any of those things. No, I would, I would affirm yeah, that, he, sure. He, the purpose, and the Bible is explicit, again, in Revelation 4.11. He created all of this for his pleasure. Now, does he also, uh, in the process of man screwing everything up, does he then say, well, I'm going to fix it now? So and he would, does. You would say that his, his uh, desire to commune with us is out of utility and not out of desire like just the way he desired he created the earth because he wanted to is it possible to say that the same could be true of communion like i, I want to commune with you because, because I, want I want to, to. not exactly because right. not because i need to That's exactly right um, i'm actually pulling from a just god could have just wiped the slate clean and started over with a perfect world absolutely he does what he does for his pleasure absolutely so, no yeah, doubt no question yeah. and, I, and i would i would assume that when we even look, I mean, this is fast forwarding, but when we look at Paul's writing, you know, live your life holy and pleasing to the Lord, which is your acceptable act of worship. Mm -hmm. There's there are Christians that are more pleasing than others or else he wouldn't have said this is a pleasing act. Mm -hmm. So if we're doing things for God's good pleasure, it's the holy and spotless bride. That's right. That's for his pleasure. Not, we're keeping a yeah. tally of no, no, how no, saved no. I am. What how and what to what extent can I please? Yeah. The, the supreme artist. That's very good. That's very good. And, and I would con concur, uh, agree, argue um, that the reason um, that we bear the Imago Dei, the way in which we bear the image of God is artistic. I think I think that's one way that we can truly understand. Which is what you wrote God. your PhD on, in yeah, all fairness. Well, that's so, what I'm writing it on. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. And so yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It's a huge one for me. And I noticed that it's not a huge one for many others in my movement. Um, it's a huge one for my wife because she has to put up with me talking about it. Right. Now. No, but, I hear uh, that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> my wife is the same way. Someone had come up to her uh, after a service and had like I, I 
it was a good service. I'm not going to be humble about it. It was, I, I preached well. And they came up to her and they were like, you get to live with this, you know, all the time. And she looked at them and says, I've heard this sermon 37 <laughs> times. Yes, I have to live with this. She was very clear. And that's, that's not somewhere a in wife, West Texas was, right now. My wife is saying, amen. Yeah. Amen. How can I, I can't like that post fast enough, man. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I, I have to live with this yeah. at some point. You know, there's, um, there's, there's another thing that I think we need to, think about when we talk about the Imago Day, and that is we have been talking so far about the Imago Day as individuals. Mm -hmm. But there's also an argument to be made, and I see a lot of the Eastern Orthodox theologians make this argument more frequently than Western, and that is that if you really wanted to see the full image of God, you would need to see man in all nations, tribes, tongues, and both genders, that's where you see the image of God in mm -hmm. diversity. You you never just see it as one guy standing there yelling at a pulpit. It's the church. It's it's it's, it's the diversity, the ethnicity, uh, all of that stuff makes up the image of God. And from what I understand, that's what university comes from. Mm -hmm. Yes, it unified is unified diversity. That's yeah. the idea, and and they were supposed to be intended to be. Uh, Christian creating, yes. you know, units of, of gospel centered Absolutely. preaching yeah. uh, and the way that they were going to achieve this gospel preaching was unified diversity of thought, of, of ethnicity and of race, which is, ethnicity which is what makes it all the more <laughs> important to remember that when God created woman, this is significant. Mm -hmm. He did not create her as being subjugative to man. Mm -hmm. uh, all of that stuff is post fall. If you look in, in Genesis 3 before the Genesis 2, which is before the fall in Genesis 3, you can see that God creates Adam. He looks at him and says, it's not good that he's by himself. It is not good. Yeah. I'm going to create an azer. I'm going to create one who corresponds to him. Now, the English word that was used in the King James was a helper or a helpmate. And unfortunately to English speakers, helper implies a subordination. Mm -hmm. When I was a carpenter, I would have a helper that I would tell them what to do or whatever. That's not what it meant in the Hebrew at all. Mm -hmm. A helper is one who corresponds, a one-to-one -one correspondence between mm -hmm. one and another. The Hebrew word for, for man is ish, mm -hmm. and for woman is isha. Mm -hmm. And so from the beginning, in God's design, the way he intended it, Ish and Isha share a common ishness, <laughs> all right, and uh, and that's and they are considered equal. It's God Ish. It's after it is after the fall. That's clever. That several things began to happen. First of all, Adam names her. Yeah. Post fall, they put the ultimate act of societal subjugation: the naming of another. Yeah. Before that, she's just Isha. Yeah. All right, and and from this moment after the fall, he's like, I'll be the boss from now on. You are, you are Eve. He names her. It's mm -hmm. a form of subjugation that's post-fall. That wasn't God's big plan. Yeah. It's man's plan. Another thing that happens is he, the, the community between man and God is violated in the fall, but the community between Ish and Isha is violated as well. Yeah. And, and so what happens now is Ish throws Isha under the bus, and shoved, uh, he's in the subjugating business now, not just of Isha, but of the rest of creation too. When God tells man to subdue the earth or husband the earth, that carries the Hebrew concept, carries with it the idea of husbanding or caring for the earth in a legitimate sense, yeah. right? Like a husband would his family. Instead, who are the people who pervert this? The people who just exploit and use the yeah. earth, right? Yeah. And so that's the perversion. And so any form of subjugation, uh, is is that sort of perversion uh, of what God actually intended, which is why any passage used in the New Testament to subjugate females to males, I'm very cautious to interpret it that yeah. way because we have very explicitly God's actual intent mm -hmm. of gender here. And, um, and it's, it's very difficult for me to interpret those passages so specifically as to negate God's intent. We've seen what he wanted, what his big idea was. Yeah. And, uh, and, and subjugation is our big idea. So that's why I'm, I'm really interested in reading female theologians as well as male theologians. No, in fact, I think sometimes more so. Yeah. And I think, I think we should um, 
because this is such a loaded topic, I want to ask a few questions just about this specific thing. And we'll, we'll circle back around to this at a later date. I think this is an important conversation that needs to happen on air about uh, male and female and roles in the home and the church. But, but because this is such a cultural thing, I have mm. to ask this question. Mm-hmm. Um, because gender roles, gender um, <laughs> titles, I mean, we've got male, female, he, her, it, Zed, well, you of, know, of the 52 QRS, possible genders, yes, I, think, I think the male and female are the ones I'm dealing with right yeah, now. So you know, the ones that science actually recognizes, possibly. but anyway. I mean, there's, yeah. there's a couple schools of thought. So yeah. um, the, the reason I'm asking is because would, would you, in, with that explanation, say that, that though there may not be subjugation, that there are different roles? Um, the different if different commands given to men and women and to children, though that they're not subjective, that they're lesser of value. It depends. Uh, I think number one. Again, it's a loaded question. Yeah. I don't want to go too tangent. Number, it, I think but. number one, the reason that the topic comes up at all is because of an, an obsession in some quarters with maintaining uh, sociocultural subjugative roles. Hmm. Uh, there's an obsession there. And so we, we're quick to say, okay, I agree with Genesis 1 through 2, um, but there still has to be a way uh, that I can interpret uh, 1 Timothy 2 in such a manner that women can't preach. Hmm. I mean, <laughs> that's really yeah. what this comes down to. And, and really, uh, in, 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 in the, that concept, there is, you're right, it's loaded. There's so much more involved in this than, than just that. That is a very narrow uh, reading of 1 Timothy 2. And any reading of 1 Timothy 2 or Ephesians or 1 Peter or any of those that basically ignores the fact that God's idea was the same is going to be a, an interpretation that I reject. Now, does that mean that there are different roles? Yeah, but let's not use that as a cop-out. Um, when, I, when I was a carpenter and I was sent to do a bathroom remodel, uh, they sent me, the carpenter, and they sent his helper. Right? Yeah. And that guy's job was to stand there and hold the what we call the idiot end of the tape measure. Right. While my job was to be the brains of the operation and get this task done in that, in that sense. Well, well, there's no subjugation here. We're just we just have different roles. That's all. In what universe does anyone think that those two different roles weren't subjugative by definition? Sure, you know, sure. and that's that's really the game. It's a shell game that's being played by a lot of folks who who want to, who are still sort of invested in making sure that there's not a a female voice preaching uh, in a pulpit. I'll say one more thing about. Um, this particular crowd. I'm real familiar with them. Uh, real, real familiar with them. I've, yeah. I've lived among them and, and was educated by them. And, and, you know, I know their hearts. They're not, they're not uh, deliberately, it's not like they don't know their Bible. You sure, know, yeah. Everybody has an honest way of coming to this. They're being very honest with their own system. Yeah. But I noticed that uh, there has been a retreat from hardline subjugative roles to I'm dialing it back and sure. I'm going to nuance it a little bit. You'll find that uh, o- that over here in in the position that that we in the Assemblies of God hold, we we haven't had to change it at all since 1924. Yeah, <laughs> same position. We don't have to dial it back. We don't have to dress it up. We don't have to ma- you know reread Scripture through a different lens. We don't have to say. Well, stop saying subjugate and just say roles. And this, you know, one of these positions has to keep getting dialed back and redefined, and one of yeah. these has stayed fairly static. So. We'll have to circle back around to it, man, because yeah. I think I think this is a conversation that people are wanting to hear. I've got a question from Justin Daughtry. Uh, Justin watches. I know that regular. cat. He supports us, man. He's a good guy. And he's anyway. He says, uh, "Would you say uh, he created us for his pleasure? Then we messed it up." So now he's fixing it because he loves his creation. That's exactly right. That's what the whole Bible is about. Amen. From, from Genesis 3 to Revelation through Revelation 20 is the story of how God is fixing what man messed up. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That's, I couldn't have said it better. A young theologian in the making, Mr. Yeah. Daughtry. Yeah, yeah he, he's, yeah. he's a good supporter, man. He's yeah. always on here. I like that dude, man. Sharing. Good friend yeah. of mine. Thanks. Thanks for the question. If you guys have questions, feel free to ask them. I am monitoring questions as we are live. Um, one, one more thing on anthropology before we move to sin. Sure. Um, it's important to recognize that the Bible presents mankind as a separate and distinct creation for God's pleasure. Mm-hmm. Mankind is not an animal. All right. Oh, that's a good distinction. Yeah, there yeah. is, there is we, there, the, the whole naturalistic <laughs> reductionism 
um, from Darwin on, sort of tries to re-envision man as just another in an endless loop of species that are going to come and go. But God doesn't see man that way at all. Mm -hmm. uh, mankind is God's special creation. And it, he, it is for mankind that, that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die. So, yeah. uh, so man uh, has been made a little lower than the angels in this regard. And we're, we're not animals in mm -hmm. that sense, which, is, which brings up uh, how, we, how we work this concept into our sociopolitical dealings. Uh, I love my dogs, for example, but the idea that my dog's life is worth the same as my son's or my wife's life that is a distinctly yeah. non-Christian understanding. Uh, a Christian understanding of mind, anthropology yeah. demands that we see mankind's and man's life, human life, as being of the penultimate value, yeah. uh, more so than anything else. Absolutely. And that really closes us off on anthropology for now, I guess. So, I mean, I, I think that's a, a fair question, just to ask a, a quick uh, theological cap of that, because people would ask me about evolution, and they would ask me about those kinds of questions. I'd be out in the street evangelizing. I'm always trying to get them off of evangelism, or off of uh, evolution and onto Jesus. So mm -hmm. I, I skirt it as quickly as possible and get straight to Jesus. <laughs> yeah. So I open up Genesis and it says, and God spoke to the earth and he said, let the earth bring forth living creatures. Mm -hmm. And I go, does that sound like evolution to you? And they go, yeah, I guess so. I was like, okay, cool. Yeah. You know, uh, and I move off of it as quickly as possible sure. and get straight to Jesus. Now, yeah. the reason I say that is because I do believe that there is room for the idea of, uh, animal evolution within orthodoxy but Species. you must i think to be within orthodoxy believe that humans are a distinctly separate uh, creation absolutely now i would i would also i would make the statement clear that people who believe um that cats came from dinosaurs i still think they're wrong <laughs> but I think that they're within orthodoxy. They're, they're yeah. still brothers. Sure. Um, but the second someone says we were a monkey and we yeah. evolved into this, I yeah, think that, that makes that makes God a liar. That makes God yeah. a liar. And I think that you I remove agree. yourself from orthodoxy I because agree. we are that makes us a created being. That's and not that's why anthropology is one of the cardinal doctrines. We we must we mm -hmm. must uh, come to grips with who mankind is in God's eyes from yeah. his perspective, not not from how we think we looked at it. But most of the naturalistic reductionist understanding of anthropology is less than 150 years old. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, what I'm describing as orthodox is, you know, three or four thousand years old, if not more. So uh, it's it, the, the Johnny come lately that are trying to reinvent the wheel here. Uh, the, the truth is that. Um, that man, there's not one shred of creditable scientific evidence anyhow that, that would link uh, <laughs> mankind with a separate species. Uh, right. that, uh, the two episodes that have come close were both hoaxes. Yep. And so that's, uh, I'm, remember that I'm, I'm a guy who believes the universe is four and a half billion years old and that mankind has only been on the earth, you know, um, you know, a fraction of that period of time. I, I agree with empirical science about sure. the age of the universe and the age of the earth and all of that. The notion that mankind is not a distinct creation of God uh, has not only remains unproven, but is distinctly non-Christian. So. Okay, so we've spent a good 30 minutes, 34 minutes talking about man. A little bit of angels sprinkled in there. A little bit of silence sprinkled in there. Those for who watched the earlier part of the show, and it was muted. Uh, and then finally, we're going to talk about sin. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's let's, let's talk it. about uh, what would be possibly um, <laughs> the, the greatest. Because the way that we define this really determines which way of the debate that we go. Let's define defining first. Let's define defining. Yeah. Okay, so uh, when, when we are uh, explaining <laughs> exactly what sin is, its effects on mankind, it's going to change our soteriology. You better believe it. And if we don't define mm -hmm. sin properly, if we don't... Then what are you being this, saved from? This is, yeah, yeah if this is man, mm -hmm. this is sin, what does sin do to man? Right on. Man. In, in the image of God, it will then impact everything everything we believe soteriologically yeah so pretty yeah, so, important so fundamental stuff okay so for example um <clears throat> <laughs> i had your title up for my name let's uh <laughs> let's one time i'm in class and i uh i'm defining let's say i'm trying to think of a a term um 
you know, I'm I'm defining systematic theology in class or something. Some mm-hmm. some very specific term to our field that I'm giving a definition for it in class and they can remember and we can work with. And a student either skips class or he's just not paying attention. He's mm-hmm. he's uh he's bumping around or on she, Twitter. We uh, just, so, well, they we always just, pay attention. Oh, uh, got so it. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Okay, or she. And we just talked about yeah, it, Michael. Come and, on. And uh and and then later, the, in a paper, they cite dictionary.com for this definition, which actually only contains about this much of a definition that's this big, right? And they wonder, why am I getting this wrong? Because defining something is different than just copying and pasting a quick objective phrase, um, sure. a subordinate clause from dictionary.com, all right? Right. Um, I have I That's have four narrow. good metaphorical definitions for sin, and I think all of them can be equally true depending on the situation. Let's let's deal with the first one, the one that the one that is the most famous: missing the mark. Sure. All right. The hamartia, the missing of the mark. The the oops, I messed up. I I was walking along and I accidentally stepped in a steaming pile of sin. <laughs> And uh, well, look what happened to me. And now what a we, hot mess. We've just really, yeah, exactly. That was good. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> Trying. Now, now I'm just going to hose this off, and and uh, we'll be fine. You know, mm-hmm. we don't have to think about that anymore. Right? That's that's one understanding of sin. Um, but there's also another understanding of sin that's equally biblical, and that's out and out rebellion, a declaration of war. Yeah. All right. So the, the morning enmity, after hostility. Yeah, yeah. The the morning after December seventh, nineteen forty one. President Roosevelt went to Congress and asked for and received a declaration of war against Japan, mm-hmm. a, an actual declaration of hostility. We are in a state of armed hostility against your country. Sin is really the ultimate definition of sin is that mm-hmm. it is a a form of deliberate, willful rebellion against God and what God holds to be true. And really, the most honest uh, atheists and agnostics and non-Christians today will say, yeah, that actually makes a lot more sense to me. Uh, I do feel uh, very much at war with God and the things of God, you know. And so that that's a good definition of sin that that's a little more all-encompassing than the other one. Mm-hmm. As long as it's just missing the mark, Josh, then... You know, we can still we can still be wrong. We can still be uh, that sin is only if I fall into error and realized it later, you know, or something along those lines. But actually, that lets you off the hook in your nature. That lets you off the hook in your proclivities, which you, when you're honest, know good and well, always tend toward self and sin. Sure. All right. And so rebellion actually explains that a little bit better. Um, the New Testament loves to explain sin in terms of slavery, right? Yeah. That that when you are set free from sin, the chains are broken and you're set free. Uh, the, what's the opposite of that? Well, I'm I'm in chains to my sin. I am a slave to sin. A great New Testament metaphor for sin: a slavery to oneself, mm-hmm. right? And then, of course, the Old Testament and the New Testament both use as the principal metaphor for sin, sexual sin, adultery and prostitution. Um, that God has said, you know, you, when, when Israel is the nation she's supposed to be, mm-hmm. she is the virgin bride of Zion. Right. When she decides she wants to worship wherever she wants to worship, any way that she wants to worship, and she doesn't really care what Torah says about it, yeah. then what is she? And according to Ezekiel, she's a hola and a hola bus. She's a whore. Yeah. She's a prostitute, right? Overused garden tool. Yeah. And yeah. same thing in the New Testament, uh, when the church does uh, trust who she's supposed to trust she's the bride of Christ and when she trusts in her own way and her own codes and her own rules then she's you know could be described as the whore of revelation you know and so uh, sexual sin uh, particularly adultery and prostitution are used as a metaphorical definition of of sin as well Um, one of the sickness one of the things you have to remember is that the fall is here's the fall God comes along and says to man if A, then B. Think of it as a logical proposition. Mm-hmm. If A happens, then B will happen. If you eat of this fruit, death will ensue. 
Right. The day you eat of it, you yeah. will surely die. The death ensues, all right? Along comes the enemy. By the way, does God prove his point? Does he defend his argument in Turabian footnotes? And uh, No, no, he just nope. he offers it, and he expects that man will accept it by, what's the magic word I'm looking for here? Faith. I Faith, would yeah. yeah. And now along comes the enemy, and he says, did he really say if A, then B? No, 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 no. If A, then C. If you eat of this fruit, you'll be awesome. You know, there's a problem that God wasn't telling you the truth. If you eat of the fruit, you're going to be awesome. Does he defend his argument? Does he offer evidence? No. No, he doesn't. No. no. Once again, he expects that mankind will accept this proposition by faith. faith. So man hmm. is faced with two logical propositions that he must accept by faith. And he looks at both and says, hmm, I think I'll go with this one here. And what is he essentially doing? He is choosing, he is turning away from the greatest possible good, God's will, to a lesser good, his own will. It is a turning away from God to self. What is all sin ever after? A turning to the self. What's good mm. for me? At the expense of what's good for the church or my wife or the other. You yeah. know, uh, that all sin is predicated on that. Co- By the way, why do you think that millennia later, the only way that a person is saved is God has given them an opportunity f- for a great cosmic mulligan, a do over. Replace that faith from this dumb proposition to the correct one. Yeah. You know, that's that's really the definition of salvation, to trust God, to trust God's provision. And so because of that, this tendency in all of us that we're all born with to turn toward the self, that is sin. Mm. And this is an important thing to remember. We are not sinners because we sin. Rather, we sin because we're sinners. It is the way that we're born. Mm. We're born this way. Sure. We're born flawed. We're born messed up. We're born with this tendency toward the self. And it must be arrested by the blood of Christ. It must be redeemed by the blood of Christ. It must be discipled out by the Spirit of God, which always happens in the in the church, in the community of faith. So let me let me be a little nitty gritty with your definition. We do not sin we are not sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. Mm-hmm. And that's a little bit of a simplistic reduction, but again, I'm, we're, we got a simple show. Yeah, so. yeah. So, <laughs> so, and the reason, the reason I'm asking is, is because of the, the broadness of the topic, because um, many, especially in the Reformed faith, um, would say that we are guilty of sin from birth, mm-hmm. that, that when we come out of the womb, we are guilty of sin. Uh, right. We are born in Adam, uh, and, and the wage of that sin is upon us. But then for people like me and my wife or the hundreds of others, hundreds, thousands, millions of women who've had miscarriages, if you are guilty for sin and a child has died in infancy, what happens to said child? Mm-hmm. If they are not just um, have a sin nature, but are a sinner mm-hmm. worthy of the wrath of God, how does that Scripture is, is not as, Scripture is not as explicit and how we deal with this problem, there are a couple of different ways of dealing with it historically in, in Christendom. One uh, is the way that the Eastern Orthodox and Western Roman Catholicism deal with it, and mm-hmm. many other liturgical denominations. Um, it, we're we're going to talk about this a little bit more in ecclesiology, but it, it is um, a statement that, that shines throughout 2,000 years of Christian history that no one is really saved apart from the church, that, that the Lord saves people in the church. Now, where I'm, when I talk about salvation, I'm not just talking about the little moment of justification when you right. first trust Jesus. I'm talking about the process of sanctification that comes after it yeah. as well. And all of that together is what the Bible thinks of as salvation. And that happens within the community of faith. And so what the Easterns and the Roman Catholics uh, do is they say, well, how fast can we get this little one in the community of faith officially so that no matter what happens to them, they are written in the book of life? Mm-hmm. And that's the idea behind pedo baptism and mm-hmm. things of this nature. All right. Um, those of us who believe only in believers baptism, uh, that that's what we embrace. Uh, we will. Uh, come up with a a concept that we call the age of accountability. Mm -hmm. Not particularly scriptural, 
Uh, it's really difficult to proof text this one. It's just not there. Mm -hmm. But it is a philosophically derived concept um, that if all of these other things about anthropology and homarchiology are true, then that means there comes a certain moment uh, before which God is not holding someone responsible since there is a certain amount of light that has not been shed on this problem yet. Mm -hmm. We do see evidence textually of that in soteriology. Paul speaks about this where, where the Romans are concerned. Um, but the age of accountability is something that is um, embraced by, by our movement. Uh, it's embraced by our denomination. It... Um, it has its own problems textually, uh, mm -hmm. but it is a feasible way of understanding that though the baby is born with a sin nature, our merciful God uh, understands uh, what the situation is and has a great deal of mercy and grace on this child who hasn't had the light of salvation shown yet. Um, that, that's another way of dealing with it. I, um, it's, I know it's a broad subject that's hard to address in such a short time, but we have, um, I, I think the reason that it's important is because um, uh, there, ha in my mind, sin is so judicial, and I know, I know that it's only one of many mm -hmm. examples. One of the one of our problems is that we're so obsessed in Protestantism with yeah. the judicial thing yeah. that it's difficult to see the rest. But yeah, yeah. Well, right. I mean, I, I mean, I, I, I acknowledge that sin is a sickness as much it is it is a mm -hmm. violation. Um, that it has totally infected us. I love the term totally depraved, though I define it completely different than I think Reformed Doctrine guys would, mm -hmm. um, because I, I don't believe there's anything in us that wants God. I, I think that we hate God and love our sin mm -hmm. from birth. I think we're bent that way. We don't like him. We don't want him, and we're at war with him. I think that's our nature. Uh, and I think it's only God who, who, who starts that initiation. It's only God who softens the heart. And then I think there is a synergy that takes place that man then has the option. And I know we're getting into soteriology, um, but the reason I bring that up is because I, I do think um, for the piece of those who are watching, when we're talking about depravity, we're talking about what sin does. It certainly affects us. Mm -hmm. It certainly uh, uh, is in us from birth. But when it talks about an actual violation that's worthy of judgment, eternal judgment at that, I think it's a sentient action. I think it's a conscious action. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a... Um, I think I think we have... We're talking about, uh, uh, to some extent, apples and oranges contained in the same crate. Yeah, uh, there is sin that is sentient and and um, deliberate, and then there is really all of us are really born guilty. The, the sure. reformed position is really a, a, a fairly standard biblical uh, position, and and I'm glad you brought it up because it brings us to Augustine, mm -hmm. who is the guy that really codifies this for all Christianity. All right, and and uh, and what he essentially says is, you know, look, all mankind is is born with with two qualities, mm -hmm. all right? Total depravity and a total inability to come to Christ or choose God. In Pelagius. In, in, one, his, in nah. his natural state, in his natural right. state, all right? And we would all sort of agree with that. Now, my Reformed brothers and sisters like to believe that they alone have, like, the patent on Augustine and mm -hmm. that we classical Arminians are not really Augustinian. But we actually are. Right. We, we affirm, the classical Arminian affirms total depravity of man, total inability to come to Christ. We, we're not born with a choice. Right. All right. That choice flows from the cross. All right, and that's that's the Arminian position right there. Is that is that we're dead? Dead men don't choose anything. It takes a miracle for us to say, "I'd like to turn away from this yeah. and be someone different." That's the the Spirit did all that, not you. Amen. Uh, wasn't anything you did. It wasn't any merit in you, and that's why only salvation is only by grace. So uh, why is that it that regard. everyone is? You're either a Pelagian or semi-Pelagian. Anytime that anyone wants to say that you're Armenian, you're talking having a conversation. Well, those are people that just reformed. don't know words mean things, and some people don't know what those words mean, and so they okay. start calling people names. I mean, uh, that it's the same thing that you you mentioned Pelagius. Uh, Augustine says these things. He writes these things. He didn't just come up with them. They're from Scripture, right? And along comes the monk Pelagius. He's a preacher, a fellow preacher, right? Mm -hmm. And he's actually Pelagius is the 
is the pulpit preacher and Augustine is the theologian. Mm. That's an interesting little paradigm that we yeah. see working there. Uh, He's and, the consumer uh, Christian. Right? Got and it. so And so Augustine writes these things and Pelagius says, no, 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 no. Mankind is born fine. What he what he does, he learns how to be a jerk throughout his life, mm. and that that's the deal. Well, they argue back and forth for several years over this, and finally the church gets together uh, at the Council of Orange and and says, you know what, uh, this is um, this is <laughs> the exactly Council of uh, apples and oranges. Yeah, the, the Council of Waterburger is the one that's coming <laughs> up next, I believe. But at the Council of Orange, you know, they say, you know, look, Pelagius is is wrong. Uh, it doesn't hold up to Scripture. We're condemning that. Pelagianism, therefore, is the idea that there is something in us, not from our in our natural state, that enables us to be good. It has right. nothing to do with the synergistic approach of salvation. Correct, and and there is um, there is a potential charge of semi Pelagianism in some aspects of Roman Catholic soteriology. Mm-hmm. I think that charge is overblown. I will explain more. Uh, next week when we talk about soteriology. Sure. Um, but, for example, one of the famous guys in our own movement that a lot of people in our movement really love, Charles Grandison Finney. Uh, right? Yeah. Uh, and there's absolutely <laughs> no question that Finney was, if not semi-Pelagian, fully Pelagian. Mm. Uh, he honestly did argue. And he, and words. I've got a book. I've got a book by him where you can see it right there in print. I mean, he, he honestly believes... That, that mankind is born with the ability to be retrained for goodness. Now, that's not even dealing with Finney's um, terrible understanding of atonement. He had a Grotian or governmental view of atonement, mm-hmm. which has uh, been, re- been rejected by all. <laughs> you know? yeah. but, uh, but the idea that mankind has good in him, and he just, he just needs to work harder for his revival, uh, that's a that's that's there's nothing Christian about that. It's not it's Augustinian. Catholic. Yeah, even the Roman Catholics would reject that. Wow. So, yeah. So that is that that's some sometimes we just have to look at ourselves and clean our own house a little bit before we <laughs> walk around shaking our fingers at uh, people in other movements as yeah. well. But, you know, one one other quick thing um, when it comes to sin uh, and the notion of how sin is transmitted. I've always been interested in the um, difference between a creationist and a traditionist. I don't know if your audience is familiar with these two words. I don't know that I am. In, this, in this concept of, of homarchaeology, when I speak of a creationist, I'm not speaking of the earth, the creation of the earth. I'm talking about a, a belief, a, a homarchaeology that teaches that God creates each soul uh, yeah. in, in the womb, hmm. okay, um, at, at every time an individual is born, all right? And because the soul, and be, because this person is then born in the womb, they are also inheriting the sinful nature uh, mm. of, of Adam in that situation. The traditionist is the individual that says, actually God created Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve, through the act of procreation, are then responsible for the creation of, of the next generation, so either parents are responsible for the for the uh, generation of generations, and that's an inter. The traditions have an interesting way of resolving the original sin crisis. Sure. Right? Uh, well, that we're, we weren't technically created by God; we were created by our parents. Right? Mm. Of course, I would reject that because we are created by God, and yeah. I think th- uh, Psalm one thirty nine is a wonderful guide for us about how we're knit together by God in the womb. So mm-hmm. I, I'm with the creationist position, as is are, are, are people in my denomination. I like how you, you you cited Psalms yeah. one thirty nine opposed to Jeremiah. Ah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you know what? I could have cited that too, had I remembered. Wait a minute. Hold on a second. Take two. I was going to say. I, was say uh, consumer... I deliberately didn't mention that. No, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> like uh, uh, the, the consumer, and the <laughs> there's a there's a, a graphic uh, of Batman and Robin. You seen this? Where he smacks Robin. Oh yeah, the yeah, the great meme. Well, yeah. yeah so so there's one of of uh, Robin getting up and quoting Jeremiah. I think it's 2911. Oh, I was knitting together yeah. my mother's womb, and he smacks him, <laughs> and it says context because obviously that was written to Jeremiah, not to us. Right. But you cited Psalms, which would would apply in yeah. a sense. Yeah, um, that does apply. Yeah, interesting. So, yeah. Uh, uh, okay. So as we as we are discussing this, I, I know that 
time. I'm gonna I'm gonna tack on another five minutes onto that if we can. Oh, all right. And, and the reason I'm doing that is bonus because five. We had we had silence there for a little bit. We did. I was, I, I'm taking it back. I'm gonna reclaim what the enemy has <laughs> stolen in Jesus' name. There okay, you go. So, uh, Claim it. Let's let's talk about declare uh, it and decree it, bro. I <laughs> declare five more minutes. That's um, not how it works, Michael. When when we are talking about, oh, let's do this one. When we are talking about uh, the three persons again, Adam, Jesus, us, the effect of Adam's sin on him, the effect of sin on Jesus, and the effect on sin after we have been born yeah, again. Yeah. Can you can you walk us through some of that? Sure. Because sure. I think one of the important. big the problems that you're attempting to solve here is did was Jesus born with a sin nature? Right. Yeah. Uh, that, that's because Jesus is fully God and fully man. Is he being born with a sin nature? And and of course, this is because of the nature of the hypostatic union, which we talked a little bit about in Christology. There is a great um, there is a great wall beyond which none of us will be able to travel. Mm -hmm. The wall of mystery, the mystery of the hypostatic union. You know, uh, every now and then someone will ask a question, the answer of which lies on the other side of that wall. <laughs> yeah. You know, as a finite human, I I don't know exactly how. He is fully God and fully man and the same person in these sure. regards. And this would be one such area, although I can say that um, much of the New Testament would be um, a complete lie if Jesus Christ were born with a sin nature the way we're talking about it here today. All right. Instead, Jesus Christ, being born fully man, is able to identify with us because he undergoes temptation. The fact that he responds to it the way the first Adam didn't, and we would argue as theologians the way the first Adam couldn't, hmm. all right? that he does this, um, that's what makes him able to identify with us. I think Anselm... Let me, uh, let me pause you before ahead. we get on to Anselm. Are, are you saying that Adam couldn't have rejected the serpent um i probably shouldn't have phrased it that way um that is, that is pure speculation there okay that's pure speculation as there. theologians yeah. we would say yeah. couldn't i was like mm, this theologian's yeah. cautious about that statement. as cowboys fans we could <laughs> say i'm more comfortable yeah, with that one yeah uh, that's pure speculation yeah it's pure pure speculation that we'll get you saved on air today there you go that. yeah well it's it's, <laughs> it's not because i had prefer another team it's yeah. because i don't watch football we'll get you saved here <laughs> this is texas uh this is part of the soteriological makeup of, uh, of, our, of our denomination yeah. no jesus uh, anselm speaks about a, a major problem that mankind has because of the fall god is the offended party mm -hmm. because of the fall all right man must repair that relationship he must make the first move to god apologize make it right make restitution fix it he's unable to mm -hmm. all right because he's dead He's not dead. God was lying, right? He's dead. So God is able to, but he shouldn't have to. Man should, but he's unable. Into this chasm steps the God-man, sure. who is both willing and, and able, able to take care of that situation. And okay. that's cura deus homo. That's Anselm, and that's proper atonement theory. It's a substitution atonement. Which... We're all for penal substitutionary yeah. atonement. So the idea uh, the, that in between state, I just want, I'm going to make sure I'm as clear on it as possible. Jesus is born not being tempted by his own sinful desires. When the Bible says that when we sin, we're we're not we're, we're it's not by God. We're comes we're from within us, within ourselves. Mm -hmm. So would you suggest? Would you state? Hypothesize, however you want to say it, um, that Jesus was not pulled by his own sinful desires but that he had the likeness of sinful flesh, meaning that Satan could tempt him the same way he tempted Adam. That's a fine workaround. Uh, for, for the record, I don't have a problem with the idea that, that Jesus, being fully man, had the flesh sure, and was, and was experiencing temptation. If you'll recall, what, what Jesus says in the Garden of Gethsemane really, really sort of captures all of this. Mm -hmm. Well, if only there was an easier way of doing all of this, um, you know, that'd be awesome. But <laughs> ultimately, not what I want, what you want. He's demonstrating that there was a there's at war internal, in his own members. He's, he, he, there's some, there's what he wants versus what God wants. And in that moment in Gethsemane, in that second garden, mm -hmm. in the first garden, man looked away from God and chose himself. 
in the second garden, Jesus Christ looks away from self and turns to God. Mm-hmm. And, and that's why he's the ultimate God man. And therefore, it not only identifies with us, but alone can save us. That's good. That's okay. So, I, I, just being very, very clear. So, we have um, mankind before the fall. So, from Adam to Jesus, you have people who are saved by faith through the grace of God. Least any should boast on the, the basis of the shed blood uh, of Jesus on, Christ, because yeah. they, it was it was paid for it in the same way mm-hmm. that uh, one day uh, my car will be paid. That's right, exactly right? It's, it's very credited. good. It's my car. I'm driving around in it, yeah. but it's not paid for yet. The right? banks so technically, they're, yeah, they're walking gotcha. around in salvation, mm-hmm. um, but it hasn't been purchased yet. There you go. Right, so I they like it. same effect of, mm-hmm. according to I think it's Romans five. Am I right? Mm-hmm. That we talk about we're all wasn't Adam deemed righteous by faith? That yeah. whole concept now. Jesus comes into the world, dies on the cross. There is something better that I perceive when I read scripture that we have access to that Old Testament saints didn't. So first question is, is there some some effect of sin in Old Testament saints that left them in a level of bondage that we are more free of? I know that's a complicated question, but I think it's it's necessary. I think it is a necessary question. It's a very good one. I I do think that there is something new that happens on Calvary. This is the ultimate moment in time, the climax, act three of all human history right there. Mm -hmm. When that veil is torn in the temple, mankind now enjoys from that moment on an access to the Almighty that he has theretofore not been able to enjoy. Mm-hmm. Now, salvation was on the same basis in both Testaments. Right. But the direct access to God is what has changed. And therefore, the benefits of that salvation are more full. They're right. more rich. And in fact, they alone are true after that moment. One, one, one more thing that I would point out. I'm looking for ways to, to do an object lesson here. What All do you right. need? Let's, <laughs> let's use your keys and my keys here. All right. <laughs> So, uh, let me just, uh, okay, so, you here, let me see that key oh, thing, man. too, yeah. Don't all right, so, so we're all bound by time, all okay. right? Uh, we have a past. I'm going to hold uh, this up because it is pretty low on the table. Okay. You'd have to hold it back okay. for someone to see it. Okay, we have a past, all mm-hmm. right? We have a present. Can they see that one? A little further or back. Do I need oh, to way, way right back there? There you a go. present. And we have a future. Got it. See that one? Mm -hmm. Past, present, and future. We live in the present. We have a past, and hopefully we have a future. All right? (laughs) And we're all bound by time. We're bound by that time. However, you know who's not bound by time? is God, represented by this Samsung Galaxy 5. God exists outside of time. He is not bound by time. Therefore, everything that happens to God is not in the past and future, it is always present, right? And so in Genesis 3, which to you and me would be like way in the past, God says, Genesis 3, 15, I'm gonna fix what you broke, folks, mm-hmm. right? And, and, um, and, and even says at the end of Revelation, behold, I come quickly. You and I, we're standing here, we're looking back there going quickly, uh, really? <laughs> come on, say uh, quickly. Yeah, come on, man. You and I are meaning <laughs> something real different when you say quickly, you know? Uh, but for God, it's literally the next moment. Sure. It's literally the next. He wasn't lying. Mm-hmm. And so all of these Old Testament saints here, their, their salvation is the same salvation, right? And it's on the same basis, uh, on the, the shed blood of Jesus Christ, all right? But it just hasn't been purchased yet, which is literally the, the next half minute you know i mean so because god exists outside of time he's no liar he's telling the truth about all of those things and so it's an it's another thing that and we'll get into this next week the reason that we are saved all right but as paul describes this in first corinthians we are still being saved Mm -hmm. all right and the ultimate salvation doesn't happen until we're on the other side of the eschaton here so okay yeah so uh Final clarifying question, because I know we have to wrap up. Um, if, if it's too complicated, we might have to do it later. So you just let me know. Um, there is something to the effect of that when the Spirit is given, that life is given with the Spirit. And that uh, this New Testament life, that Jesus Christ has come to give life in all of its fullness, could not have been given prior to 
um, the New Testament death, burial, resurrection, the regeneration of New Testament saints. Is there something about the newness of life that we now have access to that Old Testament saints didn't? Um, and that that might say freedom from sin on some I see level. What you're saying. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm really trying to frame yeah. it. I think I think it's a corollary to the other question. The benefits of salvation are richer, fuller. They're more. They're more. The yeah. Old Testament yeah. salvation. We had, we un, unlike uh, then we can have victory over sin. We can. This was um, and this was the analogy that I used last week. Um, so. So a lot of people in our movement want to teach that that victory happens in one moment. So that then when you screw up, you don't really have that victory. And then you have to go back and, and do it Then you again. still feel really bad about it and you're racked with guilt. And uh, you know, the reason that there's more substance abusers among failed Pentecostals Ooh. than anybody else in Christianity. There's a reason. And that, that's because of an inadequate and not particularly well thought out sanctification doctrine. I was Shots a smoker. fired. Yeah. I, and I'm Pentecostal, so I say it. From within the camp. I'm dyslexic, so I speak to my own people. That's right. (laughs) Go ahead. I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing near you. Homeschool high five. It's a a proximity issue. Uh, I was a smoker for 20-something years, two packs a day, you know, and uh, it was impossible for me to quit. That, but... I smoked my last cigarette 14 years ago, and mm-hmm. now if I smell someone else, if I if I pull up behind you in a car and I smell cigarette smoke, I get sick to my stomach. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about being changed. I was transformed. I was mm-hmm. transformed. Now it did not happen overnight. The way I'm presenting it to you makes it sound make it makes it seem really quickly. The change did not happen that quickly. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that's something that we need to learn how to come to grips with as a people. For sure. That's good. So yeah. um, I have I have uh, pastors and teachers um, who, who I do respect. I wouldn't consider uh, uh, consumer Christianity, uh, but guys who have really gone to the in-depth research to see what is it that we have access to. And I think that one of their greatest grievances is the way people would talk about Old Testament saints being saved. And they're like, yeah, Old Testament saints were saved, and we have the same kind of salvation as David, and the same kind of salvation as Abraham, and the same kind of... And and there was a great grievance inside of them to say that that there's something new, there's something better that we have. And they didn't like using the word saved. Um, uh, But I I acknowledge that the word is really interchangeable in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Yeah, you want to be careful with it because the immutability of God is at stake here. Yeah. If God is saving people in a different way in the New Testament than the Old Testament, then God has changed, and mm-hmm. therefore he's not God. Sure. So that it's important that we, this discontinuity between Old <laughs> and New Testament that sometimes runs in Christian, as a, that's been going on since Marcion. Yeah. It is important that we stand against that. There's a continuity there. Do we have yeah. a week that we're talking about law? This is probably the way we're going to have to wrap this up, but really separating what the law is um, because that is something I hear constantly. Not in systematic theology, but maybe look, we can make room for it next week in soteriology and yeah. talk about it for a minute. Yeah. I, think, I think that would be that would be yeah. necessary. In the meantime, if you could just see to it that you don't eat a goat boiled in its mother's, mother's milk, milk this week, yes. that would mm-hmm. mean a lot to me. 10-4, so, message yeah, received. Yeah. Okay. I thank you guys so much for tuning in this week to the Remnant Radio. Boom. Unshun. I'm going to do this. Unshun. Uh, thank you so much. Every week we broadcast our lunchtime theologian from uh, 12 o'clock to 1, and then we have an evening show tonight uh, from 8.30 to 9.30. Tune in. I'm going to have Matthew on uh, from the Storehouse Church. We are actually going to be talking about pneumatology again, uh, something that me and Michael talked about last week, but me and, uh, and Matthew will be talking about this week. It's going to be a great episode, so come back on 8.30 p.m. Central Standard Time, and if you feel blessed by this ministry and you want to donate, you can give at our website, The Remnant Radio. Dot com. Be blessed, guys. We love you.